In this video, I want to talk about hiring, mostly around a couple of things. The first one is the junior versus senior debate. The second one is going to be around old school versus new school AI engineering. I think the third one is going to be maybe startup versus bang. And then lastly, maybe around research versus applied. But before I do that, I want to talk about basically the, the number one thing I'm going to look for, which is just someone who's like caught the LLM bug. I've interviewed a bunch of folks who were very into classical methods, but really didn't explore a lot of the work around prompting and search and whatnot. And that's challenging. I've interviewed consultants that admitted to me that they feel really behind on what's going on. And if you're trying to build something towards the future, you want someone to meet you at the future. You don't want to hire someone with this idea of, okay, they're going to have to learn because if they were going to learn, they would have learned. I, I truly believe that. And I think, that, I think that's definitely a big issue in some of the people I've been interviewing where they just really haven't picked up any of the, the new ideas. There's been a lot of companies too that are, are focused around things like RAG and whatnot. And there, I really feel like we should be just looking for folks who have good experience in information retrieval and recommendation systems. And that has not been the case so far. And I, de I definitely think that's something that we should work on. So the first thing is around junior versus senior. And I think what I want to talk about here is why it hired junior folks. Teams now can be so lean that hiring a junior person is usually going to be a setback. Even if they're really talented, it's a setback because it needs to be a lot more mentoring. You don't really trust the code that they write. And even if you find someone that's a very high agency, high agency is a magnitude of the vector, but it's not the direction of a vector. And so when there is work to be done, someone who's junior might work twice as hard and work twice as long and you get more time, but they might get distracted or focus on the wrong things. And you might come back to an answer to a question you didn't even ask. And not even a way where, oh, you hadn't thought of the question, but they, through you know many iterations, went off the beaten path and into a region of the you know problem that doesn't really need to be answered. Whereas a senior person, maybe there is less agency, but, but, but because they know how to prioritize the work, they can get the work done in two or three hours because they know these other questions don't matter. They're not going to get distracted. They've done this before in some other context. And that's what you're getting. What you're getting is your own time back by hiring someone senior. Whereas when you hire someone junior, you are saving money, but you are paying with your own time. And the question is how much of that time do you value? And, and what are the things that are higher impact that you could have been prioritizing that you're, you are not prioritizing because you've hired someone who's junior? The other thing is around classical machine learning experience versus this contemporary, like modern LLM stack. The modern LLM stack is not that hard. There is nuance in prompting and you can probably get some tips by just doing some research, but prompting isn't the hard part. The hard part is getting data. The hard part is quantifying what is important. And the hard part is getting people involved, like domain experts or the founders or whatnot, to really make sure that the thing you're building is solving a problem and we know how to improve upon that problem. Whereas if you get someone who has been prompting a bunch, they can get you a answer, but it might not be the answer. It, not, it might not even be an answer to the question you care about. And again, those are some of the dangers. One way I really try to capture that is just by asking questions. Please tell me a time you've deployed a system in production. What were the challenges you ran into and what are the trade-offs you had to make? And my hope is that you know, maybe there were not that many challenges. Maybe the challenges were just getting the data, which is a great answer. But the trade-offs really got to be interesting. If there was no trade-offs, it means you didn't really deploy something at the boundary of any capabilities. If you just picked a model and you went with it, you didn't really think how hard about why you picked that model. There are times you want to deploy neural networks because the accuracy is very important. There are times where you want to deploy logistic regression because you might care about latency and, and simplicity and explainability. You might want to manage the maintenance complexity of these systems. Maybe it was around precision and recall and you had systems that, some systems that cared more about precision and other, others that cared about recall. Maybe it's around changing how features shift over time. Maybe it is how to a B test things in production. Maybe it is around how you can split the data to avoid leakage. All these things are interesting things that people should hopefully have experienced and have worked with. The fourth point is around whether you had come from a startup or you came from a big tech company. 
And the primary thing that you run into is for a small startup, these people are used to the fact that when you join some of these smaller startups, you are being shit. You're in integration hell. You're building out logging. You're making sure the logs are getting S3. You're doing some like deployment stuff. To me, all that stuff is really boring. But some other folks are very skilled in doing this full stack DevOps work. Whereas if you, I think if you hire someone who's very experienced or had a lot of experience at a large tech company, they might not have had to do that for a long time. That was my situation. I had so much systems work and infrastructure done for me that I just got to do my job as a machine learning engineer. Whereas when I joined all of these small startups, a lot of it is around, okay, like where's the logs? What are we even logging? What is going on? Where's the data? And where there is no data, like, the old school machine learning engineer is probably going to feel really neutered. And this is primarily because I think the, the long-term systems, machine learning systems person at a big tech company is probably more focused around research. And this goes into my fourth point, which I think a lot of times people are hiring researchers a little too soon in the process, especially when you are somewhat of a rapper company. This isn't like a derogatory thing at all, but it is the case that you want to hire research. Maybe you have some insecurity of being a rapper company. You want to feel more legitimate. But what ends up happening is, again, they just don't have much work to do. Like They want to have access to data and train models. And what you give them is 30 users with the logs and, and very little data. And it's really hard to figure out, okay, what are you going to do in the meantime? Do you want to do infrastructure work? Do you want to help us like figure out deployments and logging? And again, it's not that there's one or the other, but there's just different kinds of work. And the thing I'm really warning against is hiring machine learning engineers a little too soon because there really isn't much to do for them. And instead, focusing on software engineers and just hiring software engineers that are motivated, I think that's going to be the secret. So now we've concluded, right? We want someone who's senior because there's going to be less work on your side to manage and guide them. The difference between researcher versus applied engineer, big company, small company, these are just things you have to be aware of when you are just like screening resumes. And lastly, we talked about the fact that a lot of the work in the beginning is likely going to be software engineering work and not machine learning work. So let's just focus on someone who has four or five years of experience, hopefully one, one company who can work without much supervision, but still has some quality that we care about, qualities that will help us transition them from software engineer to become a good machine learning engineer, especially because of the fact that now there isn't actually that much machine learning. And so the question is, what do you actually look for? And to answer this question, I'm basically going to just sort of describe myself. Maybe as a little DM, but it is what it is. I think you need someone who's very product focused, especially if your company, for the most part, is probably going to be very product focused, right? Like you can't have a researcher and two other people on the team. You got to go sell something. You got to go make money. And you want to find someone who has the experience of actually trying to make money and not just doing like random research and trying to build a fancy thing. You also want someone who's somewhat data science oriented because having something like an LLM front load a lot of the capabilities means that you had you did not have to measure and capture anything to build your model. Historically, you build a model by collecting data first, thinking about how you want to collect that data, and then working really hard to get a model out of that. It right? might be six months of data to build a model, and maybe the model takes one month. Now you get the model instantly. But as a result, nothing is being measured. And so it is very important for a data scientist to come in and be able to help you measure what the fuck is going on, what do you want to improve, and how are we quantifying that improvement and making incremental progress on improving that system. Like software engineers might look at the evals and just, oh, it's not that good. It doesn't feel good. But you need someone who's much more quantitative, who understands metrics, machine learning metrics, to basically come in and say, okay, the issue is that we are not recalling data correctly. The issue is that the thing that we are fetching for the language model is not precise. The issue is that accuracy in this situation is not a good metric to determine the quality of our models. On top of that, you want someone who's also product oriented, right? You want to think about things like retention and churn and activation. And if you're going to bring someone with a quantitative background, you should probably try to find someone who has these skills as well that can help guide you in being more principled in measuring the things you want to improve. Because ultimately, I think the job of someone who's quantitative, and now I'm, I'm going away from the machine learning term because obviously machine learning to me means like collecting data, training a model. What you really want is someone who is quantitative that can think clearly and help you translate the outcomes you want into some kind of, and maybe today that math is a plot, maybe tomorrow the math is a model, and finally we're, at some point in the future we are turning 
models into business outcomes like revenue or decreased churn or whatnot. But what you really want to look for is, I think, three things. Someone who's caught the bug of machine learning or AI, applied AI. Like, it's really nice meeting someone who basically says, okay, I'm leaving this job because we're not doing enough of this LLM stuff. And I know if I don't do something now, I'm going to feel behind. And I've been studying. And I want to build stuff. Very exciting. You also want someone who's able to think critically, right? A lot of these systems is just like prompting and figuring out what to measure. And to know how to measure these things, how to slice up data, as someone who has a good data literacy, what they can come in and do, they can not only help you measure things, but also help you describe what to measure and how to measure it. And when they look at the data, they, they are able to actually think critically about the data to make future recommendations. Examples could be, hey, I was looking at a RAG application and looking at the kinds of questions people are asking. I've noticed two or three patterns, and I think these are some patterns that we can use to improve our RAG pipeline. It could improve our indexing strategy. There are some failure modes. And before I go and build out some features, let me go figure out how we can prioritize them. Oh, turns out this issue I noticed, that's only happening in 2% of the, the data set. Maybe it's not big of an issue. But this other issue I found, that was like 40% of all the queries that are coming in. This is something we really have to go and fix right now. And lastly, someone who is self-sufficient, right? Like you can't really be hiring specialists because the specialists just don't have that much work to do within the organization.